We are going to tackle today a subject called harassment. Now, harassment from the enemy comes in so different, so many different ways and different forms. But we're going to talk about this particular way that he attacks you. As I was getting this message, I saw in the spirit a lot of you that need this. Young men, old men, uh, young women. There are so many of you that need to understand this. And I'm going to show you the door that it gets in even to the the uh, the most devout Christian because they don't see it coming. They don't understand what they did to open a door and it comes in like a flood. It doesn't play around. It once Satan can get his his toe in the door, he doesn't play fair and he shoves in all the way. So what you think the problem is and what you're dealing with in the forefront of everything is probably a a, um, a a symptom of something, you know, like I can always tell when the enemy is trying to uh, click at my heels because I literally hear a clicking in my ear. Oh, it will be very, very tiny, very little. And it'll be a click. It'll click, click, click. And I know it's the enemy and I know how to handle it. But some people don't. And the clicking gets worse. But that's only one kind of symptom. There's other symptoms of something hurting, a pain. Uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe it tries in the head. Maybe it tries in the sinuses. Maybe it tries in your wrist, in your bones, whatever. It's what it'll do is, is it'll start out real mild and then it'll get worse and worse. And while you're trying to concentrate on that and deal with that, it's getting magnified. And the reason why it's getting magnified is you haven't taken care of the problem of what brought it in. Remember the video that I gave that I said where the man was consumed with lust and it was sexual lust, but how he handled it through the front door in dealing with sexual lust when really it was a backdoor problem. It was a problem with him lusting after more people, a bigger church, all of that. That lust became so great and so magnified that in the back door came sexual lust, which is his knowing to be wrong troubled him. And he never dealt with the back door. He dealt only with the front door. So today we're talking about dealing with the back door. See, the, the problem of the ache or the pain or, you know, <clears throat> whatever is convincing you you can't function and, and it grows. It, it, it doesn't go away. It grows. It's a harassment from the enemy. As it grows, it gets blown out of proportion. And you keep aiming at it, aiming at it. And you keep, why won't it go away? Why can't I get it to go away? You get, and, and I've done it where I get a lot of people praying and it still won't go away because the target is not that problem. The target is how it got in. You have, everybody has the door, which is Jesus Christ. And what happens is something will come and gnaw at you. It'll bother you. And you won't even notice. You're so used to walking with God and God's really blessed you and he's really humbled you and helped you and he's helped you in all things. So everything seems so safe, like nothing can get in. And because of that, you let your guard down to symptoms, to problems, to whatever. And so you get a little symptom, like the clicking of the ear, and you don't address it. You don't handle it right then and there. But when you handle it, it's not just rebuking it and telling Satan, get, get out of there. It's finding out why he has the gall to think he has the power 
to disturb your peace. That's what you need to find out because you see that little door, that little gnaw, he's starting to gnaw and chew on you. And he's starting to get to a place where he's trying to make a big hole. And in some cases, he makes it. But if you look up the words that I'm going to give you and you understand what gnawing means, uh, it's a worry. So you hear something. Uh, this could have happened to me with my daughter when she had cancer. I could have worried about her, wrung my hands morning, noon, and night, and been driven crazy with it. But I refused to go there because I knew there was nothing I could do except allow God to have her. And that's the way he told me. But that's between him and I, and it's a long story, and it's it's bigger than this one. And this one, once he got the foothold with the gnawing, and then the worry, oh, my goodness. It, it, look at circumstances and situations, what worry means. It's really something worries you. It worries you. It works on you like this. It rips and tears at you like a dog worry, worries a, a piece of rag when he's playing. He worries it. He goes back and forth with it, and he just worries it. Well, worry is comes in the door of fear. Ah, but now you haven't noticed. You haven't noticed that when you heard something, you became afraid. Instantly, you became afraid. But you didn't handle that either. And the reason for it was, is you had a lot of other things on your mind going on. So what God has to do with you, he has to separate you from all those other things. And he has to take you aside and sit you down and begin to talk to you. And at first, he will help you get healed of that gnawing. But still, the problem isn't gone. The, the base of the problem, the core of the problem is still there. And if you begin to worry about something else without realizing that you're worrying, then you have trouble. So here you are with this terrible, terrible problem that you can't seem to overcome because you did not go to the back door where the basic problem that come in like a flood to everything was fear. Fear this is going to happen. You know, like I said, this could have happened to me. Very easily happened to me. So I understand what I'm talking about. Because I could have been terrified for my daughter. Terrified in every way if I did not know that the Lord is greater than everything. But that fear worries you and gnaws at you. And you begin to hear little symptoms of what the problems are. And that troubles you. So there you have trouble, worry, fear. You have all of that gnawing at you until it manifests with a physical problem, whether it's pain in the head, whether it's pain in the elbow, whatever it is, whatever. Maybe it's you get real miserable, you get sick, you get, you get so many different symptoms. And all of they are is symptoms of the real problem. And the real problem has a door, which is fear. And some of you could say, but I know better. I, I don't. Uh, the proof is in the pudding. The proof of where you're at is in what happened. You can say till Tuesday, but I don't have that, but. The proof is in the pudding with what happened. And your job is to make sure it never happens again, that you never enter into that ever again.
And you can't protect yourself as long as you deny it ever happened to begin with. Well, I'm a Christian. I don't fear. I've been a Christian all my life. I, I don't ever fear. I know better. I know. Well, maybe you do. But I am saying that we're not talking about a fear that you could see, a fear that you could understand. We're talking about a fear that's hidden in the back of your mind. And it operates in the back of your mind. And it operates in the back door. It operates that way. But you get victory over it. And you get a healing. And everything happens. And now suddenly, you begin to concern yourself about the way you think. Because you've been thinking lately differently. And you forget. You forget that... When you're tempted to think something, temptation is not a sin. So when it comes before you, it feels like you should take it in. It feels like it belongs to you. It acts like it's yours, and it's not. It's a temptation. And that temptation is there because he's already has this subtle fear, okay? It's still there. It's still gnawing at you. And the temptation, you start to think something's wrong with me. Why am I filled with thinking this and thinking that? And when I never had those problems, I have all of these problems. Surely it has to be because of this. It has to be because of that. Or it has to be because of this person. It has to be. No, it's because of fear. Fear began to take root. doesn't need very much to take root. Just one tiny little pinprick. That's all it needs. Put that in an apple and look what happens. And how it grows out of proportion. So you have several things going on here. You have the door of fear that you never saw coming. And you had it come in like a flood. And now that the flood is gone... You let it sit there because you don't know how it happened. And that is where this video comes in. This video comes in to tell you how it happened and how to never allow it to happen again. All of us are human. Every last one of us. And you know that. All of you know that. We suffer the tempta same temptations. We go through the same things. You think I didn't suffer the back door of fear even after God delivered me? Of course I was tempted in those directions. That's how I can tell you. That's how I know what's going on. That's why God can come to me in the shower and give me this message. That's that's the whole reason. So you have to ask yourself, okay, I'm feeling things and I'm thinking things that are just not me. Of course they're not. You've never been like that. You've never thought that way. But somehow the enemy tricked you into believing those thoughts are yours. And so now you're worried. You're fearful. Because you seem to be consumed with them. And that gnaws at you. So here we go back to the door of fear and worry and gnawing at you. Only it took a different form. How do we get rid of that? How do we? Look, the enemy operates like this. As soon as you find him out, as soon as you discover who he is, how he works, what he's doing, he has to flee. Because you don't want any parts of him. You don't even have to say you don't want any parts of him. You just, as soon as you recognize it, boom, he's done. He doesn't have a foothold. He doesn't have one tiny little bit in you. And even this, is this harassment is not in you. It'll never be in you. You're filled with Christ. It can't get in. It can't knock down the door. Oh, it can put, you know, you can take something and you could put a million 
feelings on this. But it still can't penetrate through if you don't let it. And that's the way you are. You let whatever he does to harass you, defy him. Uh uh. I belong to Jesus. This is done. You're not going to do this anymore. No matter where I go, no matter what I do, no matter who, no matter what. Thank you, Jesus. No more. You will not come through that door. That door is locked and it's closed because I will never be afraid. I won't be. If I have a, a dog and he gets sick, which I do, I have a dog, and I worry that he's going to die. Something bad's going to happen to him. It's going to come in like a flood and it's going to harass me. And once he does that with that dog, he'll do it here, here, and here in everything until he gets me to a place where I start thinking the way I'm thinking is wrong. And therefore I must have really sinned. I must be no. Oh no. Temptation is not a sin. Don't receive these things unto yourself. Don't receive that the enemy can penetrate and bombard your mind till he thinks he has you and you think he has you because he doesn't have you. He can't. You've been bought with a price. You've been bought by Jesus Christ. You've been bought through the blood of Jesus Christ. So when a thought comes that you have never thought before, you know that's not yours. You know that's a temptation to think that way. And temptation is not a sin. That's that harassment. He comes Now he's coming in a different form. Now he's coming to worry you about your thoughts. You see over here, he worried you about a symptom. Over here, he worried you about perhaps your dog or your children or your mother or your father. He lost that battle. He lost this battle. Now he's trying to take over your thoughts. Make sure he loses this battle. None of these battles are hard to overcome. I've seen people just lay there filled with symptoms, filled with this one happening, that one happening, unable to even think out of it, when all they had to do was let go of fear, let go of worry. Let go of thoughts that are not theirs. So all they had to do was decide, make a decision. I'm not going there anymore. I don't belong to you. I don't belong to anybody. If something would come to me and harass me and want me to be tempted to get angry with somebody, to hurt somebody because they hurt me real bad, I would begin to think about that. If I allowed it to come into my thoughts. But you see, when it comes into my thoughts, I re rebuke it just by denying it. I don't have to say, Satan, I rebuke you. You leave me alone. Oh, I don't have to talk to Satan. All I have to do is deny it, reject it. It has no power. Treat him exactly as he is. Nothing in your life. Nothing. Understand how to overcome different symptoms. There are people who, uh, even in illness, how it's been upon them so hard, so bad, that all they see is what's happening. This is, this is it. They can't, they can't go anywhere with it. They can't, it's so bad. It's so bad. I've been there. I've done that. And what I did was is I just pled the blood of Jesus Christ till I told him, get his filthy hands. I don't care what I feel. I don't care what I'm going through. How do you think I overcame all of those things I went through? Because when he lit, went like this so fast, so hard, so much, I could have given in to it. I could have said, I'm done. I saw a man who had 
And I loved this man. He was uh, a relative of mine. And he had the FOMA. And he got it. He was a uh, he was in special forces, and he got it. And uh, and so he had tumors. And I said to him, "What did you do when you were in Vietnam?" And he said, well, "I said, how did how did you stay safe?" He said, "Well, I prayed." I says, "Well, cancer is no different. Cancer is a battle between life and death." And you fight it exactly the same way you did when you were on the battlefield. You fight it. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of God's wing. He will give his angels charge over you. Fight it. After we prayed... All of the symptoms disappeared. All of the tumors disappeared. Three years later, one tumor came back. And you could not convince him to think and believe God did it once. He'll do it again now. The first thing he said that was out of his mouth was the way he finished. I'm a dead man. As soon as I said it, come back, boom, I'm a dead man. No matter what you said, no matter what he did, you did, he believed he was a dead man, and he was a dead man. You have and are what you believe. Listen so carefully. When you know you've walked and talked with God all of your life, you know he pulled you out of this and he pulled you out of that. Your heart has to say, he did it once, he'll do it again. I mean, my goodness, after I come out of open heart surgery and they said that the mitral valve was regurgitating and throwing blood on my lungs and there was really no hopes for me. They also said that I had, uh, I, I needed a, a, a bypass. So they had plugged up three, three things. They took a vein out of my leg and used it for a bypass instead of a stent. And I think they did that because of my age. And who knows? I don't know. But anyway, so when I come out of open heart surgery, you, <laughs> Oh, I'm telling you, they said when I was on that table and they broke my ribs and they put my heart on the table, they said my heart fibulated so powerfully bad, they never dreamed I would live through the operation. They expected that heart to quit at any time, and it didn't. <laughs> and I remember uh, the one doctor that did the major operation saying, She's too tough to die. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, after that, having the 176 beats per minute, I mean, go out and run. Get your heart rate up to 125, and you'll be breathing like this. <sighs> Mine was 176 all day long. Before open heart surgery, it was 199, 225. So when I went through that, I could have said, oh, but I didn't. I got up in the name of Jesus Christ and I did everything, everything, you name it, I could do it. After that happened, then I suddenly I couldn't walk anymore. I couldn't function. I couldn't anything. And every muscle was in excruciating pain because they found out I had a hole in my heart. And that hole was making sure that I was living off of deoxygenated blood, meaning that there was no uh, oxygen being pumped to my blood, which kept my muscles from having oxygen 
and therefore it was an excruciating, weak, and painful condition. So after they plugged out the hole, I could have said, I'm done. Never did that occur to me. After that, they said, you have a leak. Your tricuspid valve is leaking so bad that it's, uh, it's too big for us. We only have an experimental clamp. I could have said, huh, I'm done. They said, if, if you don't do this experiment, we'll have to do open heart surgery again. And we're not successful second time around. And they showed me your heart's going to fill, your lungs are going to fill up with fluid. You're going to fight that the rest of your life. You're going to go through this. You're going to, you have to get this procedure. I could have looked at God and said, I'm done. I'm a dead woman. I could have done that. I could have accepted all of those symptoms, all of the, of the misery of being sick and not being able to do this. But I didn't do that. I crawled. I crawled across that bed. And I looked up at Jesus. And I said, I'm going to spit in the devil's eye. And if I die, I die. But he won't get the glory from my life. And I began to move. In the name of Jesus, no matter how bad the pain was I began to move and as I moved strength came to my body as I moved power came to my body and I started laughing and Jesus was right there laughing with me listen to me don't give in to the lies don't give in to that you can't make it don't give in to it When it is your time, do you know what will happen to you? God will come to you and tell you. It's time. Come on. He's not going to take you necessarily by disease or whatever. He's going, he'll take you, but you'll love it. Come on. It's time. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Lord, I don't know who needs this message. I don't know how desperate they are in the things that they've gone through, but I know the ones that you showed me, you showed me their faces. Thank you, Father. They came before me. Give strength, Lord God, to their faith. Give power and wisdom. Let it all lock together in the glorifying Jesus Christ. Let it all lock together with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to overcome everything where the enemy has attacked, not only their body, but their mind. In the back of the subconscious of their mind, bring forth, Lord God, a faith that is so great that the enemy can't pull them down. I will walk in the name of Jesus. I will do in the name of Jesus. I will have in the name of Jesus. I will go in the name of Jesus. Thank you, 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 Jesus. They're your children, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. They don't belong to me, Lord. They belong to you. Don't let them get their eyes on me, Lord. Let them have their eyes on you. On you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. When you suffered on that cross so that they didn't have to, you suffered on that cross and you were beaten. Dear God, help them to have the faith that by your stripes, Jesus, they are healed. They are delivered. You paid the price to deliver and heal them. Thank you, Lord. Enter into their minds and hearts and bring forth faith. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Make a way for them like there is no way, Lord. You see the things that try to manifest 
Lord God and say they are bigger than life. Life is Jesus Christ. Nothing is bigger than Jesus Christ. No one is greater than Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What did you say, Lord, to the lame man? You said, take up thy bed and walk. Lord, he had to try. He had to move. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's what you had me do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How many times he said, I can't walk, and I walked. How many times he said, I can't think, and I thought. How many times he said, I can't, and I did. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Wrap them in your arms, Lord, and lift them right up. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to continue in prayer for all of you right now. Thank you, Lord. 